All right. Good morning, everyone. We'll get started. My name is Katie Domrat. I am the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the BMFA. And today for our March 3 and 30, we're going to talk about some new acquisitions into the collection. Uh, Dr. Christopher Oliver is here to speak about them. And with that, I will pass it off to Chris. Thanks, Katie. Uh, good morning and welcome, everybody. Uh, as you may know, it's Women's History Month. And so the idea was floated that we think about works in the um, permanent collection of American art that have been recently acquired that were um, the products of women. So we have three paintings we're gonna talk about today, hence the, you know, the, the whole idea behind the three and 30 program. Um, and we'll spend a little time with each of them. And then hopefully if there are any questions, we can go over that at the end. Uh, I am Chris Oliver. I'm the Bev Purdue Jennings Associate Curator of American Art. Uh, and I was really privileged to help shepherd uh, in one way or another each of these three works into the collection. And so uh, I'm really excited to share them with you today. Um, let me, so then the kind of um, both the oldest in terms of how long it's been in our collection since uh, the spring of 2020 and uh, in terms of when it was produced, is this painting, Grapes, by Hannah Brown Skeel. Skeel uh, is a, an artist who's primarily known for her still lifes. She often concentrates on fruits, flowers, other kind of uh, organically grown um, vegetation, and, and shown within a domestic interior. What's interesting about this work is it goes a slightly different route in that it doesn't show these grapes on a tabletop or in a kind of uh, kind of really well-defined scene within the domestic setting, but rather is a trompe l'oeil or rather uh, French for deceive the eye painting. Um, before we get to that, we'll, let me talk about who Hannah Brown Skeel was. Uh, much of her biography is, is still unknown. Um, but she's born in Maine. She grows up in New England. Uh, and we don't know where she may have gotten any artistic training or whether she was self-taught. By the 1850s, the late 1850s, she settled in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, where we can see that she's an active artist who is exhibiting her work in exhibitions in St. Louis. We don't have an, a, a precise exhibition record for this work in the 1860s when we think it was produced, but she certainly was active and showing in St. Louis. Uh, interestingly enough, um, though there were only a handful of professional women artists working in this time period, especially in St. Louis, she uh, kind of cohabitated St. Louis with another very prominent artist, Sarah Miriam Peel of the famous Peel family of American artists. Um, Sarah Peel also concentrated on still lifes. And so while we don't have any documentation that Skeel and Peel knew each other or ever communicated, it's just so probable that two artists working in this medium exhibiting their works in St. Louis would have perhaps known each other. And maybe Skeel perhaps would have uh, learned a little bit about the long history of still life painting uh, that uh, descended in the Peel family. But let's return to the work at ha hand here, grapes. So we kind of have an, an, an what may seem an innocuous uh, or very typical subject for a still life painting. Uh, grapes are often featured. But I think if we consider this a little bit more, I think we can see how this is a bit uh, unusual or surprising. So what we have here are three clusters of grapes, three different types of grapes, first of all, uh, which speaks to, I think, the um, availability of different types of grapes grown in different parts of the U.S. and transp transported to metropolitan centers like St. Louis. Uh, the, the American um, wine industry was blossoming in this specific period, and uh, this is something that Skeel may have been uh, aware of. So we have the three different types of grapes. I'll note that the the ends of the of the um, of the vines and the stems are kind of precisely cut 
So we see the presence of, uh, uh, the implied presence of shears or gardening shears that have made this clean cut. And then they're bound by this red twine and hung on a nail, a single nail. And this is kind of uh, maybe a bit nerdy, but we can see that the nail is a factory made nail. It's got a preci precise square rectangular really head that indicates that this was uh, a factory produced nail, which is again, another 19th century kind of industrial uh, innovation. So we have skill kind of blending the, these ideas of natural and man-made in this small but very kind of potent composition. Now, perhaps most interestingly to me is at the very bottom of the composition, you can see that a single red grape is falling through midair. And what this says to me is that it's a, 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 a further evidence of this trompe l'oeil idea that the artist has just bound and hung these grapes on this red nail and just stepped away. They've just been jostled enough that the red grape is just falling. So Hannah Brown Skeel's presence is kind of implied here just out of the frame as she's kind of organized this composition for us. Um, I think it's a remarkable work that, again, speaks not only to the artist's genius and presence, but to this blending of um, the kind of natural and the man-made, uh, all in this ele elegant canvas, um, which you can see, of course, I should point out that all three of these works are not only recently acquired, but hanging in our galleries. So I hope that when you have the time to come to the museum, you do see these works in person. So the next work I'll talk about it carries on a kind of similar theme. Uh, this is Imagined by Helen Tor. Um, Helen Tor was, uh, and this was just acquired last spring, so even more recently acquired. Um, Helen Tor was a, a modernist painter who worked uh, in the, what we call the Stieglitz Circle of American Artists. Um, the Stieglitz Circle is named for the photographer and gallerist Alfred Stieglitz, who was really a kind of dean of the American art world in the first four decades of the 20th century. Um, he, of course, helped, he had a significant career as a photographer himself, but he, of course, promoted a, a whole um, bullpen of artists, including his wife, Georgia O'Keeffe, um, Marston Hartley, John Marin, where do we go on? Ansel Adams even, um, but also including in regular showings at his several galleries was the painter Arthur Dove, who was the husband of um, Helen Tor. And Dove experienced much more fame and success during his lifetime than Tor ever did. Helen Tor was um, a, a, a really talented painter, I believe, uh, but only ever showed her work in two exhibitions in her in her lifetime. Um, her second exhibition was at Stieglitz's gallery at American Place and included this painting, Imagined. What we have here is another still life that speaks to the natural and the man-made. We have four flowers here in an opaque, opaque vase um, before a lace curtain. This was painted uh, on board the, um, the houseboat in which she and Dove lived in, in uh, that was docked in Huntington, New York. Um, they both uh, had very meager circumstances. And I've spent some time going through the Helen Tor and Arthur Dove diaries. And it was a special occasion when she would buy things like flowers and take them as a subject for her painting. Um, so this was a really kind of... Um, ambitious work for her. Uh, we see oh, also what I'm struck by in the Helen Tor diaries is how much time she had to spend either mending or making clothes for her and herself, for, excuse me, for her and her husband. And so uh, when I see this lace curtain with these Nautilus designs on it, I, I'm really struck and wondering whether this isn't something that uh, Tor would have made herself on board that boat the Mona. Um, um, the flowers, the vase, the curtain, all to me 
kind of provoke these haptic sensations, these sensations of touch and feeling, the delicacy of the lace and flowers with the kind of weight that truly centers and 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 foregrounds the entire canvas of that um, opaque vase at, at, at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> shells were a very frequent subject for Tor. In fact, after she died, um, once somebody who was going through her house recalled finding just shelves and shelves with boxes and boxes of shells. So she was really interested in um, these kind of natural objects and taking them as her subject. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, this painting was in that 1933 exhibition at, at an American place. Um, Tor largely spent much of her life supporting Arthur Dove's career. Um, and at the end of her life, actually requested that all of her artwork be destroyed after she passed. Luckily for all of us, that was not the case. And her sister was able to salvage uh, the works and get um, an art, specifically the Heckscher Museum in Huntington, New York, interested in the work that, um, in which they then mounted a very seminal exhibition. And Helen Tor has been collected for the past 50 years as a, a really underappreciated in her own lifetime modernist painter. And I'm really pleased, really pleased that we were able um, to welcome this painting into the collection um, just under a year ago. So this has been a fantastic addition. So the last painting I'll talk about is Isabel Bishop's 14th Street, which we acquired in 2021. Uh, Isabel Bishop is uh, a Cincinnati-born painter who studies in New York City under several of the leading artists um, at the Art Students League, uh, including Kenneth Hayes Miller. Uh, and she, like many of her teachers, takes as her principal subject um, the streets of New York and the people who inhabit it. In fact, the the, um, the quote she used for the the people who inhabited the streets of New York were the everybody's and the nobodies, and that kind of I think really cuts to the core, perhaps, of what this painting is about. Um, she's really well known for her depictions of the new woman. That is the um, <clears throat> is that is a, a term used for women who were in the first half of the 20th century, able to uh, kind of uh, achieve financial independence by <clears throat> having professional careers uh, in the many industries and services that a burgeoning city like New York City offered, uh, whether they be banks, law firms, et cetera, um, and use those funds they achieve by working themselves to live by themselves and to fashion themselves as a thoroughly modern person. Um, so in 14th Street, we see a woman uh, just off center in this fashionable cloche hat and dress um, holding her purse, I presume, and, you know, showing this, this kind of sense of independence as she walks through a crowd of not just men, but there are at least two women in this crowd um, that shows how close, uh, how uncomfortably close sometimes you know, the streets of New York City and other urban centers can be, while also there's a sense of um, apartness, a separateness. You're so close to these people, but you have no sense of communication between anybody. There are two men talking it right, but there's a sense of that loneliness in a crowd that I think is so perfectly um, um, represented in this work. Now, Isabel Bishop, along with people like Kenneth Hayes Miller, were uh, part of a loosely uh, associated group of artists known as the 14th Street School. And what that meant was that they they not only lived and worked near 14th Street, which was which defines the lower, the southern border of Union Square, um, but they took it as their subject. Uh, and so several years ago, when we were first approached about this painting, um, it was absolutely remarkable to see that uh, the, the painting was actually called 14th Street and depicts 14th Street. Isabel Bishop had been on in our collecting plan 
for the better part of the last decade. So we were really pleased to welcome this work into the collection in 2021. Um, when I went to New York and saw this painting, I then actually went down to 14th Street and kind of stood in this exact spot. Maybe I should have included the photo I took, but the uh, Con Egg building, which is the large building you see in the center of the composition is still there. Um, and, 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 you know, the crowds are still as oppressive and, and, and tight and um, anonymous as they were in 1934. And so what we see in this painting is this kind of uh, very different sense of the modern city and of modern sensibilities um, in terms of what she was aiming for it, as opposed to what Helen Tor was, which is this kind of intimate and private uh, and <clears throat> very sensual feeling, whereas Bishop's painting almost um, kind of overloads with the sense of the busy city, but delivers that kind of sense of loneliness and apartness um, that I think makes this such a poignant painting. Well, thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And we'll see. hopefully see you next month. Thanks, Chris. Thank you all. Bye.